Welcome everyone to the Nuclear Engineering Senior Design Presentations. Once again, uh, please help yourself to refreshments throughout. It's okay to get up and, and get something to eat and kind of refill on a regular basis. Um, I wanted to introduce our department head, who's known by many here, but there are some other guests that are, are this is their first visit. So um, you have Dr. Kostadine Ivanhoff, who's the department head here. He's been with us for two and a half. Almost, almost three, three years here. So I'm going to turn it over for him to say a few words. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, and I would like to welcome you to our yearly senior design presentations. And of course, I want to thank first the members of our undergraduate committee and advisory board for being here and for our mentors, industry and lab mentors, which work with our students. We are very thankful, we appreciate. This is really great help. And all our efforts are for our students. And you are helping us to make this better. Thank you very much to all of you. All right, thank you. The senior design administrator who has been working with the students over the year, the academic year, has been Dr. Borum. So I'm gonna have Dr. Borum say a few words. This is really the most pleasant time of the year when we get all of our wonderful teams coming over and present their work. Of course, we are very proud that their presentations usually in the ANS comes back with winnings. So this year, out of the seven, we have three winnings and we have one winner also from our undergraduate symposium. So we are very proud of all of their work and we will start with the first team. Thank you all, and let us start. Now, as we're going through, think of your questions for them, because they're gonna give their presentation and then open it up for Q&A. And, and they know questions are coming, so let's make sure we pepper them with some. Okay, first team. All right. Hi, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Chris Sedota. I'm Alex Tunnel. I'm Steven Sawyer. I'm J.D. Ellisor. And we are the first senior design group. Uh, we are going to be presenting on loading pattern optimization with a focus on relative fuel risk for a two-loop Westinghouse pressurized water reactor with gadolinium burnable absorber. So we also have Takesha Hart from South Carolina State. She couldn't be with us today, though. Uh, our faculty advisors for this project were Dr. Maria Avramova and Dr. Kosadine Ivanov. And our Westinghouse advisors were Shuang Du and Baxter Durham. So a quick overview of our project, we can really split this up into four main objectives. Uh, we want to develop an optimized loading pattern for our core. Uh, we want to perform safety and thermal hydraulic calculations on the loading pattern. Uh, then we want to compare the relative risks of all of the loading patterns that we developed using Westinghouse's loading pattern risk assessment tool. And then we want to actually create a tool to automate this process. So a quick outline of our presentation. We're going to be talking about loading pattern optimization and the subsections of those methodology, and then we're going to present our results. Uh, safety and thermal hydraulic calculations after that, and then we are going to end with our loading pattern risk assessment. So we're going to start with the methodology. So to start, we're um, looking at Boundary Waters Unit 1, Cycle 30. Um, this is provided to us by Westinghouse. Um, we have Cycle 29 provided here, and it is um, we're going to have a two-loop Westinghouse uh, PWR, 1677 megawatt thermal, 121 assemblies, 14 by 14 pin array with gadolinum burnable absorber, which I will talk about in a couple of slides. So we want to start with what is a loading pattern. Um, it's an arrangement of assemblies of both burned and fresh. And in the picture here, we have the green to be the fresh, the orange to be the once burned, and the yellow to be twice burned. And of the fresh fuel, we have several options. We have different enrichments of 4.6 weight percent, uh, 4.95 weight percent. <coughs> and then for our burnable absorber, we have the number of gad rods, which is either 4, 12, 16, or 20. And so our original goal <coughs> was to flatten the power distribution, which here we have a comparison of a non-optimal floating pattern, which this is one given to us um, at the start that we just ran it to see what it would output. And we have peaking factor versus radial assembly location with our motivation being on safety and economics because we wanted to be as flat as possible. 
And then as far as design criteria, we have six. Uh, the fuel inventory to be less than 56 feet. Um, and then maximum unrotted and rotted F delta H, which is the entropy rise ratio within an assembly. And that is to be 1.5 and 1.55 respectively. We have the moderator temperature coefficient to be negative throughout the whole entire cycle. The shutdown margin to be greater than 1700 BCM. And then the end of cycle boron concentration to be greater than 10 ppm at our cycle length of 21,000 megawatt days per MTU. So to talk about gadolinium burnable absorber specifically, it's uh, if uh, integral fuel burnable absorber, it's processed into the fuel with 8%, 8 weight percent gadolinium, and then it has two major absorbing isotopes, uh, GAD 155 and 157, which occurs 30% naturally. Uh, we have advantages and disadvantages. For advantages, it's uh, slower depletion. The MTC is easier to meet. No if but hump in the middle of cycle. And then the disadvantages is the reactive penalty at the end of cycle, and the other isotopes do not deplete. For our development methodology, we first started by simply trying to dampen our hot spots, which was done by shuffling, changing the enrichment, and increasing burnable absorbers, which, as you can see for the orange line, is uh, very unsteady and wasn't that good of approaching our limit of 1.5. So then we introduced a heuristic method where we set the enrichment and fuel placement, and then we only shuffled once burned assemblies and incrementally increased burnable absorber, which we can see steadily decreased our results to our limit of 1.5. And then the code used is Nexus ANC9. Um, it consists of several different codes of alpha, paragon, and ANC, where alpha is the cross-section generation paragon is the 2D transport with 70 energy groups, and then ANC, which is the 3D core calculator using diffusion theory of two energy groups. <coughs> and then the ANC actually outputs um, core reactivity, assembly pin powers, uh, reactivity coefficients, depletion, as well as control rod and fission product worths. Okay, so going on to results, uh, ultimately our group designed uh, three loading patterns that met all of our design criteria. Um, so here's an example of our first one. Uh, you can see the, uh, uh, the image generated in bear view shows the peaking factors at a cross section around the, uh, the center of the core. Uh, and you can see through the burn up steps uh, how it decreases um, throughout the cycle. So you can see that the max FTH is below the limit of 1.5 and the cycle boron is above the 10 ppm limit that we were set, but it, it's well above, which means that there's uh, more excess reactivity than we would like in the core. And you can see that we're using the maximum number of feeds we're allowed to use. Um, so going on to uh, our second loading pattern, it's very similar. It also meets all of our design criteria and has a slightly better um, peaking factor, um, which is good, but it also still has that high end of cycle boron. And it also uses the maximum number of feeds that we're allowed, which is 56 again. Um, one thing that's different from loading pattern number two and loading pattern number one is that it uses more uh, highly enriched fuel on average, which means that there's more reactivity, which means we ultimately had to put more burnable absorber in it, um, which you'll see has effects on uh, how peaking factor um, propagates throughout the cycle. And loading pattern number three, um, you can see the FDH is worse than the first two at 1.499, but it still is below the design criteria. And the end of cycle boron is much better than the other two where it's um, right about where we want it, which is just above the 10 ppm limit at the end of cycle. Um, number of feeds, uh, is less, which is uh, why we have the end of cycle boron closer to our reactivity goals. Um, we used four fewer feed assemblies, and that is uh, economically attractive for designing a loading pattern. So here you can see the peaking factors through the cycle of the core. Um, you can see loading pattern number three um, staying just below that limit line uh, at the, towards the beginning of the cycle. And you can see loading pattern number two actually ends up with a bit of a peak midway through the cycle, and that's because of the amount of burn milk absorber we ended up having to put into that cycle, um, burning up and uh, resulting in positive reactivity at that time. Uh, end of cycle boron. Uh, so you can see uh, boron throughout the lifetime of the cores. That's kind of uh, what you expect, where it just decreases. Um, and you can see loading pattern three again staying just above uh, the limit of 10 ppm at the end of the cycle. So the loading pattern that we ended up deciding on um, to present uh, was loading pattern number three, and that was most because end of cycle boron is right about where we want it. It meets our other design criteria, and it uses fewer feed assemblies. 
uh, which is um, ideal for designing a loading pattern. So economically, uh, why the fewer fee assemblies? Uh, we estimate uh, it's approximately $3 million worth of savings with, uh, through using uh, four fewer feed assemblies, and that's because you don't have to purchase uh, four, fewer, four feed assemblies, obviously, and you also don't have to send uh, four once burnt assemblies to storage uh, because you put them back into the loading pattern and reprocess them. So that's why we end up uh, selecting loading pattern number three as our loading pattern. So I'm going to talk about some safety and thermal hydraulic calculations. So the shutdown margin is essentially the uh, the rod um, worth, the control rod worth um, after the I'm sorry. Control rod. So it's the uh, it's the excess negative reactivity that we have to ensure that we can safely shut down the core at any, any point in the cycle. Right. So um, to calculate the shutdown margin um, conservatively, we skew the power to the top of the core, and um, we assume the highest worth rod is stuck out of the core. Uh, in, in addition, we um, we assume that the I'm so sorry, guys. So. Uh so shutdown margin, uh, calculated conservatively, we skewed the power to the top of the core, which uh, simulates a worst case scenario for uh, when we want to shut down. And then we also assume that the highest worth rod is stuck out of the core, which uh, is kind of just ensures conservatism. So you can see our three loading patterns that we have, loading pattern two and loading pattern three. Uh, loading pattern three, we have the highest shutdown margin at end of cycle, but all three of our loading patterns are well above the minimum shutdown margin requirement. Okay, so we have our uh, moderated temperature coefficient uh, plots, uh, pattern one, two and three again. Uh, loading pattern one has the uh, lowest moderated temperature coefficient uh, throughout the cycle. And then loading pattern three uh, has the, uh, the least margin. But our only constraint was that moderated temperature coefficient had to be zero at all, po at all points in the cycle, and we hit that requirement. So routed F delta H, uh, this is, we, we talked earlier about the unrotted F delta H. This is rotted F delta H. So obviously, when you insert control rods, the power distribution is going to change in the core. So you need to ensure that you're below this limit as well. Uh, you can see all three of our loading patterns are well below the limit of 1.55. So thermal hydraulics, uh, we assume the W3 correlation for our uh, thermal hydraulic analysis, which uh, constrains our minimum DNB ratio to greater than 1.3, even under accident scenarios. Uh, thermal requirements, fuel center line temperature has to be above melt. Hot lake coolant temperature has to be below saturation uh, temperature at our pressure. And then the maximum clad temperature can't exceed uh, the, I believe it's the oxidation temperature of the cladding. Uh, so for, to perform this thermal hydraulic analysis, we use CDSC, which is the core design subchannel code. And that is based on COBRA 4. So here we just plotted our axial power profile. You can see, uh, I believe this is beginning of cycle, or no, this is when our, our peaking factors are the highest. So this is about 150 megawatt days per MTU of burn up. Uh, you can see we're slightly top peaked. Uh, you can see those dips in the uh, power distribution because of the uh, grid spacers. So we have our uh, Verview representation of the core here. Uh, this arrow points to the hot assembly. So this is gonna be our most limiting assembly and it's the one we uh, we analyzed, and then our hottest pin within that assembly, again, that arrow points to it. Uh, one of the reasons that's the hottest pin is because you'll notice it's beside uh, two water rods. So increased moderation, increased power, that becomes our most limiting rod. So these are our results. Uh, our minimum DNBR was uh, above the 1.3 limit. Maximum clad temperature, uh, well below the limit. Uh, Maximum exit coolant temperature, we're still below saturation as a whole. And then uh, maximum fuel centerline temperature, we're below the fuel melt. Okay, so now we're gonna go to the loading pattern risk assessment. And I just wanna make a, a, a distinction here. So the, the next group that's gonna go, they have a similar project, but uh, slightly different. So the loading pattern risk assessment is a relative, uh, it's a tool that Westinghouse uses to relatively rank the loading patterns. Uh, so 
We consider quadrant power till, axis xenon stability, steady state hot leak streaming, fuel performance, control rod incomplete insertion, baffle former bolt structural integrity, PCI, and grid to rod fretting. There are a lot more uh, parameters that Westinghouse uh, considers in their loading pattern risk assessment, but these are the ones we're going to be focusing on. And actually, our group specifically, this is why I wanted to make that distinction, we are going to focus on these five uh, in detail. So the other group is going to take a few others. So we're just going to focus on axial xenon stability, steady state hot streaming, fuel performance, PCI, and grid route fretting. So to make this process a little bit easier, because this would take a lot of time to do by hand, we created a Python script to facilitate this analysis. Uh, it has a pretty basic structure. Uh, we have an input file of pathways to the necessary files that we have to read data from. And then we uh, output a nice text file summary of loading pattern risk assessment parameters. Uh, text is kind of small here, but I think you can see that uh, the overall goal here was just to run the program and then we get a nice table and we can see, okay, loading pattern three is, uh, has the highest risk for grid to rod fretting. Uh, loading pattern two has the highest risk, or the least risk of quadrant power tilt. So the loading pattern designer can quickly run this tool and see which loading pattern may be uh, severely more limiting than the others. So this is the input and output from our automation tool. You can see the input, again, just pathways to the files that we're reading data from, and the output. So at the top there, we have what I showed on the previous slide, which is just a quick summary showing uh, the loading patterns in order from left to right, in order uh, most desirable to least desirable. And then below that, we have a more detailed summary for each of those parameters. So the first one we're going to talk about here is axial xenon stability. Obviously, xenon distribution is going to be important in reactor operation. Uh, so we want to see how uh, the xenon distribution reacts to a perturbation in the core. So what we're going to do is we're going to insert control rods uh, in ANC. We're just going to simulate this. We're going to insert control rods and then pull them out and see how xenon changes. So once we insert the control rods, we're pushing power to the bottom of the core. So xenon production picks up, but then when we, when we remove the control rods, that power flips up to the top and it can oscillate. So we want to make sure that oscillation dampens so we don't have runaway xenon uh, distribution. And the way we can quantify that is with a stability index. So this is a pretty simple uh, index. We just take the uh, magnitude of the first peak in the os or the magnitude of the second peak in the oscillation over the magnitude of the first peak, and then we normalize by the time of the oscillation. So uh, on the bottom here, I could format this better, but I just wanted to show uh, what the output from our uh, automation tool looks like. So you can see our stability index. Uh, loading pattern three has the, uh, the least risk of axial xenon stability. It has the most negative stability index, so it re it'll return to its steady state value uh, the soonest, and then followed by loading pattern one and loading pattern two. So steady state hot leak streaming is the next one. Uh, radio power gradients, as you can see in our beginning of cycle, uh, representation of the pin powers here uh, is pretty severe. So that could cause temperature gradient in the hot legs and any of those hot streams from those hotter assemblies, they could interact with the thermocouple and you could pick up a higher temperature than is actually representative of the hot leg temperature, which could cause a spurious over temperature trip, which we obviously want to avoid. So to quantify this, we just looked at the, um, the power on the outside of the core as compared to the power on the uh, interior ring there. Uh, and you can see it's pretty, uh, it's a pretty substantial decline because we used a low leakage loading pattern. So we put less reactive assemblies on the outside and uh, feed assemblies one, one uh, space in. So steady state hot leak streaming comparison, we looked at beginning of cycle, middle of cycle, and end of cycle. Uh, as you can see, or as you may expect, steady state hot leak streaming is a strong function of the peaking factors. So the more uh, variation you have in the radial power distribution, the more at risk you are for steady state hot leak streaming. And we can confirm that because our beginning of cycle case is the most limiting for steady state hot leak streaming. So fuel performance is a pretty basic one. We're just looking at peak pin burn up at end of cycle, maximum F delta H and maximum FQ. Uh, you can see loading pattern three has the lowest peak pin burn up at end of cycle. And then the F delta H and FQ are two peaking factors. Uh, loading pattern three performs not as well there. So pellet clad interaction, uh, again, a similar one. Fuel pellets will expand with burn up and they can come in contact with the cladding. Now that's beneficial generally for uh, heat transfer purposes, but it does introduce mechanical stresses to the cladding and can cause uh, fuel failure. So we calculate the relative risk using fuel duty, which is a Westinghouse code that tracks the, uh, the pin histories. 
and we just pulled that input straight from uh, fuel duty to our automation code. And you can see loading pattern three has the highest risk, and you see loading pattern or uh, assembly one A11 has the highest risk. It's somewhat substantial uh, compared to the other two. Uh, and I, I checked where that was, and it's actually in the exact center of the core. So we pulled that from somewhere close to the periphery to the center of the core, and that was found to be limiting for pellet cloud interaction. Grid rod fretting, again, similar. Uh, fuel rods can vibrate as the contact between grid and rod relaxes with burnup, and that can be problematic as the cycle burns up. Uh, so we look at the number of assembly faces on the periphery for two cycles in a row. Uh, you can see loading pattern three, we have zero assembly faces on the periphery again. We designed it that way. Uh, loading patterns one and two, we weren't really concerned with grid rod fretting at this point in the process, so those each have 12. Okay, our other loading pattern risk assessment items that we're not necessarily gonna go into detail about, but the other group will. Uh, uh, quadrant power tilt, loading pattern two performs the best, loading pattern one performs the worst. Uh, control rod incomplete insertion, loading pattern two performs the best, three performs the worst, and baffle form revolt structural integrity, again, loading pattern two performs best, three performs the worst. So in summary, we developed three loading patterns that met all of our Westinghouse design constraints. Uh, and we chose loading pattern three as our final loading pattern, primarily due to the economic advantage it provides. And that's because we're using fewer feed assemblies and uh, the, the cycle length is actually closer to our limit of 10 PPM. I believe it was 21, as JD said. Uh, so we're not, buying excess, we're not buying more power than we need or more energy than we need, essentially. Uh, safety calculations confirm the viability of our loading patterns, and we developed a Python script to make the loading pattern risk assessment much more <coughs> efficient. Okay, so any questions? Yes. Is, uh, how did you uh, determine that number of bases on the periphery was the correct metric for grid rod fretting? Right, so for grid rod fretting, again, this is uh, well, this is the process that Westinghouse uses. We're using their process. But uh, on the periphery, vibrations, I would assume, are uh, greater. So that really, if, if you have uh, an assembly face on the periphery for multiple cycles, that's a lot of vibration that it's exposed to. So that would be limiting for grid rod fretting because that's what we're concerned with is vibration. Right, so the risk assessment process, um, it's really a relative risk process, so we're just comparing the loading patterns to each other. You can see, uh, so for, for instance, we had a limit on F delta H, our enthalpy rise peaking factor, so we had a, a set constraint and we had to be below that. The loading pattern risk assessment process is just ranking the loading patterns based on another, so these are things that you may not have a certain um, you may not have a certain limit for, but you want to rank your loading patterns to make a more informed decision as to uh, what loading pattern you would like to go forward with. Yes? I'm going to go back to bases on the periphery. Okay. So the core still has the same number of bases on the periphery. Right. We're talking about yes, we're talking about. Bases Right, so we're looking at, has this assembly, was this assembly face on the periphery in the previous cycle, and is it on the, is that same face on the periphery again? So that's what we're looking at. Anything else? Any other question? Yes, that, that was predetermined by the Westinghouse designs. So we just up the number of GAD rods were produced. <laughs>